Get out the insurance cards, get out the co-pays. The office is open, my friends. Brought to you by DrRoto.com. What is up and welcome in. We are the one and done show. We are your fast break of college basketball information and we are back. If you haven't, if you, if you weren't rocking with us earlier, we were here about an hour ago breaking down tomorrow's DFS slate. Make sure you check that out on replay. I am your not so humble host. They call me Eric Romos. You can find me on those Twitter streets at Fantasy Nav. But that's not why you're here. You are here to pay homage at the altar of the captain of the ship here at Green Screens Media. He is MC Holland 34 on Twitter. He is Mr. Mike Holland. Mike, welcome in. We're getting a little uh, little play in action under our belt and ready to talk about the big dance. I mean, if you call what this Virginia game was a uh, play in action, like what's the worst thing that could have happened for the committee? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Just like, when it, I think you can't do anything dumber you go out and completely prove us all right. What a terrible uh, choice. They all to have their they have their arm crossed like this, watching <laughs> this absolute dreadful performance. But man, right, we love the Mountain West. The fact that Colorado mm-hmm. State shouldn't even be in a playing situation. Disrespectful. Just so disrespectful. So and now what? They're gonna be pissed off to play my Texas Longhorns. That is just gravy for me sir but uh yeah i'm excited man usually we're jumping on here uh you know doing sunday recaps or doing dfs shows we just did one a minute ago if you like gambling go ahead and check out the show that we did for tomorrow wednesday's march 20th slate um we will be on a few more times for some dfs action but also man we want to talk about this bracket challenge i think we uh i think we have some pretty sweet deal going on here so why don't you tell the folks about it yeah, if you have been watching us at all for the last uh, like 72 hours, which I think this is maybe like our 10th or 11th show in the last 72 hours, uh, we are telling anyone who will listen that we have launched our inaugural one and done bracket challenge. Pretty simple setup. It's an opportunity for you to build a bracket and compete with all of your broskies in basketball here from the one and done crew, but also our community of whip sharp whip quick breadheads right we, we've got some of the absolute uh, sharpest minds in the college basketball world that are going to be in this bracket challenge you can see how you measure up with them we play for a little bit of bragging rights but also the winner of the one and done bracket challenge will take home an autographed caleb love jersey to get involved very very simple you either head over to the show page on Twitter at one and done CBB. We have all the information up there in our pinned tweet. Or if you are here on YouTube, check out the live chat. We have the link therein. All you have to do is fill out that link, make sure you're subscribed, and then you will be emailed an invite into the tournament. And then you're in. We'll be kicking that off here, uh, I guess, in about 72 hours, right? Until the, uh, the tournament kicks off. We're still letting people in through the end of the day tomorrow. And that tournament kicking off in 72 hours is exactly why we are here, right? We're talking about uh, the brackets that Mike and I are going to be submitting to this bracket challenge. So anyone that's trying to beat us will have the inside track. You can use a little little game theory optimal to uh, to at least knock Mike and I down a peg. But I, I do think that we have some interesting overlap in our brackets overall, kind of the way that we're thinking about it. And there's a couple areas that were different. So I want to talk through some of those areas where we're different, some of the upsets that we picked, and just kind of open up the kimono with everything that went into filling out our brackets. So Mike, you want to you wanna jump in and show the people what you've put together? Yeah, uh, in 72 hours, your bracket will probably be burned down because in 48 hours, we're going to have uh, basically an entire round of 16 games played, my friend. I know we were supposed to do this show yesterday, and it feels like we've been doing this a lot. Oh, yeah. So our days and nights are completely mixed up here. But, yeah, man, it's uh, it's right around the corner. Uh, <laughs> tip in 36 hours, so let's get it going. But, uh, yeah, if you want to pull up my beautiful bracket that I have oh, set up here, my friend. Um, I mean, I've obviously uh, – <laughs> Been uh been 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 kind of hard on uh on a few number ones uh, especially on uh on this uh on this Houston team here 
So, I mean, this looks like your bracket, my friend. So, if you want to get uh, <laughs> you want to get mine pulled up here, we can uh, we can get the people oh, yeah. going for sure. Uh, definitely, definitely like um, UConn uh, to kind of take care of business um, and, and get there. I, I like what North Carolina did in the transfer portal, uh, bringing in Ingram, bringing in Cormac Ryan to go with uh, with Baycott and Davis. So. Uh, you know, I have them getting uh, all the way to the final four as well. I think the most interesting uh, side is on the other side of the bracket. Um, you know, Kansas and Gonzaga I feel like they're in trouble. So, uh, man, I really love Creighton to uh, to come out of that Purdue side for sure. Um, but I think overall, man, like the thing with filling out your bracket is we, we you, you try to pick the right amount of upsets, and then everything just goes crazy. Now, I don't think any one seeds are, are going to fall. I mean, that's only happened twice in the history of this thing. So I'm, I'm not afraid of any ones. I think uh, Iowa State kind of been an interesting spot uh, as a two seed. Long Beach playing Arizona I think is a little interesting. I mean, I'm not picking those teams to win by any means. I think where it really starts getting interesting is, is, is a couple of the three seeds here. Um, and then when you look at it, really the fours, the fives, the way that this um, committee seeded the nines through 11s, like we got Michigan State as a nine. Um, we have, you know, New Mexico as an 11. We just saw Colorado State, right? Like it's uh, because of the bid stealers, it's created a lot of havoc where we usually don't see. Uh, and, and, the, and when you combine the fact that Mountain West was completely disrespected in their seeding, you're finding some really good Mountain West teams uh, seeded nine through 11. So, I think that can kind of cause some havoc here, man. But overall, like I just think UConn has too much um, firepower. I mean, you watch them on offense; they're they're pretty incredible. I think they can play a bunch of different styles if they have to, and uh, I think they have a really good shot at repeating. Uh, I've been on the radio, national radio, saying that I believe Creighton is going to win this thing. I'm not backing down. Now, that side of the bracket kind of annoys me a little bit because you do have to you have to get through Purdue and Tennessee uh, to get there. Uh, much rather would have faced uh, you know some different number twos and, and number threes there, but I think overall stylistically they can match up with anybody as well. So I think that's why UConn and Creighton, um, I, they can really just play different styles, and that's what you need. A, a lot of the times when you play one style in the NCAA tournament, you run into the complete opposite style, and that's where that's where things can quickly fall apart. So uh, I think for me, man, like I just love the way that Creighton and UConn can just do multiple things for sure. So having a three seed win it. Feels a little weird, but that's where I'm at. What about you? Yeah, it, it definitely feels weird to to sort of uh, to climb down to a three seed to win it all. But I mean, to to be fair, right? Like this this year's Creighton team is not your average three seed, right? There are plenty of years where this team would probably be pretty unanimously seated as a as a two overall. Um, so you know, definitely don't mind the call. And, and like you said. You have been consistent with that choice from the get-go. Like I mentioned off the top, there are a lot of areas where you and I agree, and there are a couple where you and I differ a little bit. Um, so I'll pull up my bracket here. We got a sneak peek a moment ago. Um, you know, looking at the East and the South regions, a uh, lot of similarities, right? You know, we're both like UConn to come out of the East. Uh, we have a little bit of, of difference in opinion on the South. Uh, we both have Kentucky making it to the Sweet 16. I have them advancing past Houston and on to uh, not only advancing past Houston in the Elite Eight and on to the Final Four, whereas you have Kentucky falling to Duke in that Elite Eight matchup. Um, another thing that is a bit different about uh, the two of our brackets here in this top half, I'm a, I'm a bit more bullish on our guy, Mark Pope. Uh, basically, if you sat down and talked with us over the offseason, you have a soft spot in my heart. And I will in turn inflate your bracket status and stock all the way down there. So I've actually got BYU making it all the way to that Elite Eight, eventually dropping to UConn. They're it's pretty good. It's though, really too. about the <laughs> yeah, it's it's really about the three ball, right? Like this is a solid team, top to bottom, and they can score in bunches, right? So gonna be a tough out for them. Um, you know, all the way through. You know, Duquesne can uh can certainly give them a run for their money. It's going to be a very similar stylistic matchup between BYU and Illinois in that second round matchup. And then, you know, I'm, I'm really banking on 
offense out running defense in the 6-2 matchup between BYU and Iowa State. So that's one of the areas that we differ. Um, obviously, Kentucky going a little bit further. I've actually got Kentucky advancing through the Sweet 16 through one of my uh, Cinderella picks from the show a few nights ago, Colorado, the 10 seed. I've got them playing their way in. I've got them taking care of a injured and hobbled Florida team. And I actually like them to upset Marquette in the second round. So I've got Colorado going a bit deeper than you and than most will out there. Uh, moving to the other side, the two remaining uh, regions in the bracket, the, the West, you and I are very, very similar, right? Uh, the, the biggest difference being St. Mary's, uh, like I mentioned in that, uh, in that bracket reveal show, I love your call for Grand Canyon to make a bit of a run here. They just have such a tough out with St. Mary's in that first game. You know, the this is a pick that I went back and forth on. St. Mary's, they they just they take care of the ball so well. They clean up the glass on both ends so well. I just I don't see where Grand Canyon's gonna be able to get those couple of extra possessions to to really edge past uh the fifth seeded Gales. And I, I think arguably that's probably gonna be the Gales toughest uh out in the in the first couple of rounds until i eventually have them falling to north carolina on the other side of that west region mentioned it before new mexico and the mountain west at large was woefully underseeded i don't think new mexico has any business being an 11 seed i could totally see a case where uh clemson and new mexico were flopped or were flipped <laughs> yeah. in their seating um, so I've got them making a run, eventually falling to Arizona. Arizona is who I have advancing out of the West. And then pretty similar lines between you and I in the Midwest. Um, I like McNeese to advance past Gonzaga, as do you. I like them to take care of business against Samford in a matchup that we both have at 12-13 in the second round. I think Purdue will be able to take care of business against McNeese. And I am banking on Tennessee making it to that Elite Eight game. Because mm -hmm. if it is Creighton, if it is the matchup that you have forecasted in your bracket, I can absolutely see that Creighton team bouncing Purdue. So really, really need Tennessee to to take care of Creighton in the round prior if I want to, to see Purdue continue as I have them in my national championship, eventually dropping to the chalkiest of chalk picks, the UConn Huskies. Love it, man. I love where we, uh, you know... It's interesting, right? Like we know there are going to be some upsets this year. I think, I think that's the big thing. Like if we kind of think in this Midwest, I think a lot of people are, are talking about this Midwest. Um, me and you, I mean, you, you mentioned it here. Like we, I mean, with the news with Kansas, Kevin McCullough being out, like that's a problem. First of all, I've been talking about Sanford. We've been talking about Sanford for a very long time. This is not. <laughs> we were just waiting to see, you know, when when all these uh, shows came out or when the brackets were revealed. We wanted to see who was going to get Sanford. We wanted to see who was going to get Grand Canyon. We wanted to see who's going to get Oakland. Um, you know, those are the teams that uh, I, I really uh, wanted to see. Those Matt Drake too is is obviously another one. So um, before we go to the Midwest, though, man, like let's let's slide over to the East. Um, mm. For all intents and purposes, right? Like UConn got a pretty tough draw. Like when you look at this thing, man, like it's, it's one, there's the narrative, right? Like it's like, okay, three of the four or five, like you get FAU Northwestern, which we know Northwestern is the giant killer with, uh, with, with Purdue. So that battle in itself between FAU and Northwestern, I think is, I mean, it's going to be a last possession game. It's, you know, either make a shot or miss a shot, either Boo Boo or John L. Davis going to have to make a play there at the very end. By no means, whoever advances there, I don't think UConn has a I – mean, they've got an absolute cakewalk in the first one, obviously. They're just way too overmatched for Stetson. Uh, but, man, like there's a world where – and we both have UConn you know, in, into the finals and you have them winning it. There is a world where UConn can struggle in, in every round outside of the first one, like which is crazy. Like I don't know why they weren't the number one overall seed that – Purdue got bounced and they won their UConn won the regular season Big East. We know how the committee feels about the Big East. And yeah, then they won the conference is, right? championship. And then Purdue like does the Purdue thing, right? And loses in, in the semifinals <laughs> of the Big Ten tournament. 
in the history of what they have. Why would I don't know? Like your thoughts on on FAU Northwestern and like this path that UConn kind of has to go because both those teams are tough. You look at Auburn, uh, Ken Palm top six team, Illinois offensively or Iowa State defensively. Like they're on polar opposite ends of the spectrum. Do you think this is a fair draw? I don't think Purdue side is, is by any means a cakewalk. I think North Carolina has the easiest road um, or Arizona. I feel like they have the easiest paths to get there. But, man, just any thoughts on, on this east side here and the Drake-Washington State matchup too? Can't forget about that one. Yeah, this this is very much so the, the region of doom, right? Uh, I mentioned it when I went out on a limb and picked UConn to, to win it all. Um, you know, the their path to the Final Four – is is easily the the most difficult of of all all four regions right you can kind of kind of nitpick or split hairs between the other three in terms of you know which one is is the is the easiest of of the available options but far and away yukon is in here basically the formula was if you were in the final four last year or if you won your conference tournament this year <laughs> you are in the east region or you're the and, best mid-major <laughs> yeah, exactly all of the, all of the mid-majors that we think you know, in any other region would be a potential Cinderella pick um, are are sitting in here, right? So there are landmines all the way through the matchups, almost no matter how you slice it, right? We've got your bracket pulled up here where we have FAU facing off against UConn in the second round wow, and then so Auburn good. in the third round. If that was Northwestern, very tough out for UConn. If that was right. UAB or San Diego State or Yale, very tough out right? for UConn, like, right? Like, it's crazy. It, I mean... It, it's kind of weird to say the way that you've got it laid out here. I, I would feel most confident about UConn in this matchup against Illinois, just the way that these two mm-hmm. teams play. But everyone else, like they're going to be sweating bullets all the way through. I think they have the horses to make it out right now. Yeah, yeah, clearly, them, but clearly they're going to be I mean, they're going to be favored significantly in a lot of these. I don't know about the Auburn game. I think that's the scariest one for me, man. Clicking that button was so hard. Clicking the UConn okay, yeah. because we know Bruce Pearl, they have Janai Broom, right? Like they got uh, Dylan Cardwell behind him, so they got 10 fouls of quality big man, which you need with Donovan Klingon. And then you just have like a thousand guys that play. I mean, it's like Denver Jones, like uh, you know, Chad Baker Mazzara. Like it's just wave after they don't get tired, they don't care about fouls. Like that's a spot, man. Like I feel like of all the teams that could pick off UConn, if we talk about like this is hard. Yeah, but I mean, I think UConn could dispatch FAU Northwestern. Do I think that they could give them a game? Absolutely. Of the teams in this bracket, though, I feel like Auburn is the one that could really – Auburn's a, a potential Final Four team. They wouldn't be a top six Kim Palm rated team if they didn't have it going on on both ends of the floor. Um, Iowa State <sighs> – Iowa State is probably – between them and Arizona – I would say it's probably the one number two that I'm kind of concerned with because of the offense, right? Like South Dakota state, like I feel like of all the, it's an, and obviously hypothetical, right? Like I feel like if there was a number two to go down and we are shocked, it would be Iowa state. Like I just, this South Dakota, Zeke Mayo, like William Kyle in the middle. Um, they have a good team. Like, <laughs> So I would say I, I just I've had some issues with them like going even farther. Like I have Drake beating Iowa State. I don't think that's a good matchup for mm-hmm. Iowa State. Uh, I don't think Washington State's a good matchup for Iowa State stylistically. BYU though, man, like they're they are an X factor uh, in this bracket. I could easily see them beating Illinois. I could easily see them beating Iowa State. <laughs> I don't know. That UConn matchup is gonna be pretty tough for them um, defensively. So I, I worry about that a little bit, but. Yeah, man, I have UAB over over San Diego State, and and a lot of people love San Diego State to challenge UConn. Like, <laughs> it's just crazy how hard this bracket is. And I don't know what the committee was just sending a message to the Big East, like, screw getting all your people in, and also <laughs> screw your side of the bracket. Essentially, man, this is uh, pretty nuts. Yeah, clear clear message delivered to the to the Big East with how this entire selection process played out. I mean, Auburn was a very difficult name to to put UConn going past and honestly like you look up and down the the rest of the bracket like you know we'll we'll talk about them later you could make a very defendable case for Auburn to swap with Kentucky as a three seed in the south right um with Creighton as a three seed in the midwest right the the fact that there are four and they're in this region is is insane 
the the Iowa State point is is spot on, right? You've got them, um, you know, eventually falling to to Drake here. Um, uh, you know, I've I've got them eventually falling to to BYU, right? So, you know, the the defensive game, you know, it's it, it feels like especially in this one and done format where you're playing so many games it's over not a short court. period of time. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's so hard to replicate that environment. It's so hard to keep that defensive intensity up every single night. So Iowa State is a fine team, but you know they're 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 going to be in for a long road as anyone will coming out of the East. Like, and man, like all of all the number twos, said, Eric. Let me ask you this before we go. Like of all the number twos, there probably not a lot of people have. Very rarely, I would say less than one percent of the brackets probably have Iowa State getting to a Final Four out of this region. I don't see any way. With their second round matchup, even with their first round matchup, their second round matchup, an Illinois BYU or a UConn or Auburn, they feel like the number two that is 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 in a lot of trouble here. So interesting to they see. They do here. feel that way, but among that top one percent that has Iowa State going to a Final Four is the conductor Jay Heinrich calling his Final Four shot He's here. Iowa defense. State, Arizona, Kentucky. And Tennessee, yeah, right. I mean, Kentucky, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more on the the offensive side there, but got some defensive juggernauts in the mix for sure. Myron coming in, doing the Lord's work, apologizing for <laughs> for UVA being in the tournament. Jay's getting a laugh out of that. He's also heating us up, keeping things warm as we roll on. And if you are you are rocking with us, we see you out there. We got a lot of people checking in on those Twitter streets of over 300 people watching live. If you are interested in getting in the mix in the one and done bracket challenge, get over to our YouTube channel. Just search green screens media. Like you see at the bottom of the screen, our show will pop up in that live chat is the link to jump in and mix it up with the broskies with all the breadheads out there and see how you stack up in building out a bracket, but also enter to win a signed Caleb love Jersey. That is, a little bit of swag that we're giving away to the winner. So you just fill out that form, make sure you're subscribed here on YouTube, and then you will be in the mix. And we carry on here. Before we do, Jeff hopping back in, saw Jeff on the last show, Illinois crazy shooting and offense gets it done. You they make a get very stops. defendable case for Illinois. They gave up defense yeah. this year for, for Lent or something. I don't know. Whatever goes longer than four, they gave it up for the entire 2023-2024 season for sure. So, a lot of a um, lot of teams in uh, in this tournament overall that that play that style of game that are just running and gunning. And they they'll they'll let you score at will because they think that they can outscore you, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, Illinois in particular just doesn't even care defensively. <laughs> so Ryan nope. jumping in saying had Creighton as a sneaky dark horse Final Four team, but it seems like many people are on them too. Yeah, your boy here has them winning it all and has had them winning it all since the beginning of the season. They're not they're not sneaky. Like Creighton as a three, we'll get to that side in a minute. Getting Tennessee and Creighton as a two three is uh, not a lot of fun for Purdue, but their uh, their four five spot is it's it's pretty. <laughs> It, it could get pretty ugly for those four and five. So we'll uh, we'll digress. And Chris coming in, old Napesy hustle, putting Iowa State in the Final Four as well. Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't know anything here. Arizona too, at Houston, beat up. You better hope that uh, Jawan Roberts is healthy. And Tennessee hitting for the win with the fire emojis. Nice chatting with you again, Mike. What's up, Eric? Says Ryan. Appreciate you joining, man. We love talking this stuff. We. God, we grind it all year, man. What transfer portal big boards already up to like 60 guys. Nave C Hustle's helping me on this one. So we're gonna try to go 500 deep this year for rankings. There we go. If uh if you were rocking with us last off season, I think Mike, I think he set out with like a meager target of like the top like 17 or 22 transfer portal players. And we pushed you up to what 250, 300, something like that. 300, yeah. Yeah, 300. 300. So we will start the campaign right now. Mike has already anchored us at 500. Can we get him to six? <laughs> no. Can we get him not. to cover all 3,000 players that will <laughs> enter the transfer portal this offseason? There's only and one way to find today. out. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. You got to get up into these comments and you got to keep that pressure high. You got to keep heating them up. You got to let them know because ultimately, while he's over here with that meh face all the time, Mike's a man of the people. He'll give the people what he wants. So, let them know what you're thinking about 
the uh, about the transfer portal pool and how many players you want them to break down and let us know what do you think about the South region? I'll kick us off here. Um, you know, for me, this is this is a region that feels like there are a ton of different ways that it can go, right? Like, um, you know, both you and I have um, have the three seed Kentucky making it pretty deep in the uh, in the run overall. Um, we also have uh, a, a pretty interesting path that, that that lays in front of them. We've got James Madison dispatching Wisconsin in the first round that is actually proving to be a very popular 5-12 upset. I think. It is. James I hate Madison when these things be... get popular. Yeah, they're, they're, they're close to favorite. Or I think I saw them like plus 160. Like you're, you're really, you're, you're, you're eating <laughs> a lot of juice with a, uh, with a, with a 12-5 upset with, with how much, how much these have steamed up. Um, you know, while Mike and I both picked that, uh, that outcome, I mean, from like a game theory standpoint, let's say you're theoretically trying to win a, I don't know, signed Caleb Love jersey in a pool with the sharpest basketball minds out there might be actually an opportunity to pivot and go back to the Wisconsin side and try to clear out a lot of the field with that one pick because they are going to be popular. Uh, moving along that side of the bracket, we both have Duke facing off against Houston. Uh, Mike, you have Duke advancing. I have Houston making it to the Elite Eight. Uh, either or both of us, I should say, have them facing off against Kentucky. Um, you know, how we get there is quite different. Mike, you've got uh, Tech taking care of business against NC State and Florida um, uh, getting past Colorado. I have the exact opposite. I like NC State to upset Texas Tech. Uh, I like Colorado to uh, make it past that hobbled Florida team and eventually uh, drop the game against Kentucky. So uh, a little bit of a different road. I, I think that really speaks to just how wide open this this, this region in particular is. Um, you know, moving further into the the rounds this match it, matchup. You know, we we like we like Houston to to get picked off in the Elite Eight. Um, Kentucky is doing the the needful for me. Uh, Mike, you have you have Duke doing that to to make it to their Final Four. So all this is to say, right, like. You know, several upsets that we're we're each picking individually. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people that are that are putting a little bit of love towards uh, towards Vermont over the Dukies. So, Mike, taking a look at what we've we've laid out here, maybe yeah. maybe let's start with with where where we're different, right? Um, Texas Tech, uh, the sixth yeah. seed. You've got them advancing past NC State. I like NC State to keep their hot run. Um, you know how how do you see the the Red Raiders? ultimately cooling them off and making it to the next round. Yeah, I mean, this has been a phenomenal run for NC State. I've I've gone back and forth. This is a three-point line on Ken Palm. Um, I think this is going to be one of the – it's going to be fantastic. The matchup, I, I almost want to go back to the other side, man. I almost want to go back to NC State. Here's the deal, right? Warren Washington hasn't been around because he's been dealing with a lingering foot issue. If he's in for Tech – going to neutralize Muhammad Diara. It's going to neutralize DJ Burns, the dancing bear. He's not in. Like, this gets kind of scary inside. I've watched the last few Texas Tech games just getting beat up inside. Uh, Robert Jennings, uh, you know, Kyron Lindsay is a questionable tag. He's missed some time. I'm um, having to go to the freshman, uh, Yalaho, uh, who, I mean, he's, he's not Warren Washington. Uh, depth is kind of hurting them in the front court there. So, like offensively, DJ Horn can definitely and, and DJ Burns can carry North Carolina State, and I just feel like it's going to be super, super trendy. But overall, like Tech on the season, man, like they've been super efficient. Um, they can they can shoot the three ball. They're top fifty in the country in three. They make their free throws. They're top twenty in the country in in, uh, in free throw percentage. So I, I, this is a tough. This is almost like the coin flip, right? I, I started with North Carolina yeah. State. I've moved to Texas Tech. Um, I feel like Pop Isaac's starting to play a little bit better, right? So, man, this one is one of the games like that you just absolutely want to sit down and watch because you just throw the seeds out in this one. Like it, this, the way these two teams are, are playing and have played this year, and I, I feel like this is going to be one of the most fun matchups to watch and one that you yourself, when you're filling out your bracket, just want to keep flip flopping uh, back and forth on. So. Uh, <laughs> Jeff up and you're saying, JMU, no fade the public. So here, here's my problem, right? Like when these things start getting trendy, Sanford's getting trendy, which 
we were we love right we'll talk about that here in just a minute the jmu thing though like it, it it's it's really really hard to 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 pick against jmu for me man to be honest i know wisconsin made this run uh in the in the big 10 tournament I'm not just looking at the first game that they played when they beat Michigan State. I'm looking at the talent on the team, the style that they play. This is not a fun game for Wisconsin to play. Like, you have legitimate two studs for James Madison, right? You have Edwards at the wing. Um, You have Bickerstaff, who played at Boston College and can easily double-double on this team. Uh, Wall is so up and down for Wisconsin. A.J. Storr could just absolutely shoot them out of a game. Um, he could absolutely just take over the game and dominate the game as well. But you just don't know which AJ store um, is actually going to show up uh, here. So, you know, when you're second in the country and defending the three point line and you're top 50 and shooting the three and you play at a, 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 a top 100 pace and you have actual dudes. To me, I like James Madison, man. What a. Let's say you on this Colorado team that just got a, a Cody Williams back. I know you like them to, to make a little bit of noise, man. Like him, KJ Simpson, Tristan Da Silva, like just a range of outcomes for this team. But talent wise, they're pretty good. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's really it, right? Like this is this is a team that we loved heading into the season, and now with with Williams returning, like there there's not another squad anywhere in this tournament that is getting that level of, of reinforcement. Right. So like, you know, with, with him back, they've, they've got the, they've got the talent to, you know, to, to stand toe to toe with really anybody on this side of the bracket, from my, you know, my, my perspective, they, they get kind of a friendly bounce in that, um, you know, they, they'll first face off against Florida, who is going to be without Mike Hamlock, and that really changes well, if they the dynamic crazy. of that team <laughs> overall. Right. Okay. Yeah, and and Boise State is is no slouch, right? I I shouldn't just breeze past them, uh, but I I do like Colorado to make their way into the tournament, get a favorable bounce against a a hobbled Florida team, um, and and this is actually where you know while it's while it's different teams, uh, we we kind of agree that whomever is coming out of that side of the bracket is going to dispatch of uh, of the fighting shop of smarts, right? So for me, Golly. you know, it's, it's Colorado years. and the star power. It's their you know 18th effective field goal rate in the country, right? Like I, I think they'll be able to you know to to really run and gun with these guys. But you've you know you've got them dropping to to the Florida side, right? So like, what is it about this this Marquette team that kind of has <laughs> nobody feeling comfortable about them making it out of the first weekend? Kolick, is he truly 100 percent healthy? Well, is the first thing. The second thing is that when 13 years since Shaka Smart's been out of the <laughs> been out of the second round. Florida's no slouch and SEC, yeah, exactly. SEC team that you know, SEC conference really good this year. Don't know that they should have gotten eight, probably seven. Um, although you know, hobbled like hand locked in, okay, but really the one place they could lose somebody was in the front court. I mean, they've got like five dudes Pretty there. Deep, I mean, yeah. Huff, uh, Condon, you've got Tyree Samuel there. So yeah, well, losing hand locked in and his shot blocking and the ability to crash the glass, like it does hurt, right? Because now you got to go. You obviously got to go deeper into your bench. Um, really, Florida's built on guards anyway. So like Walter Clayton, um, Zion Pullins had a phenomenal season this year. Uh, you know, Will Richard is is is, is played very good. And Denzel Aberdeen has kind of taken over the Riley Kugel role and played really well. So uh, Jay saying one shining moment for Shaka. One shining <laughs> moment. I think the thing that just kind of lingers with me He's is playing is, the numbers. He's due. I think this is uh, – he definitely is due, and uh, he's a good coach too. So, like, we give him a lot of crap. Yeah, obviously, he was here at Texas or whatever. Like, ran into Michi- – like, he got Michigan State last year. <laughs> like, um, North Carolina better watch out too. So, uh, I know they have the easiest path to watch that happen. That would be – I mean, it wouldn't be shocking to anybody. So, uh, yeah, man, I just – yeah, that's two tough teams with really good offensive firepower and Marquette really good offensively. So you get a team like Colorado that shoots the three as well as they do. You get a team in Florida with that type of guard play. Like that's – and then you have the history. Like you just don't see it, right? Like it's just where is it? And then the Kolick thing. I think if Kolick were 100% healthy, it's just a lot easier to just be able to kind of slot even Marquette into the Sweet 16, honestly, for me. But it's that question mark, man. Like I don't know, you know, 
is he 100 percent they're you know, obviously gonna say that but we'll see come tournament time when the ball's tip man what's gonna happen yeah. there but i like your thing about duke like duke always disappoints uh recently so i have him in the final four his talent alone they're on a four seed we saw oral roberts get in the tournament last year and they got matched up with duke it's like oh crap like Vanover and Ace Smith are just going to be put in the locker and Duke won by like, you know, 20. So, I mean, pound for pound, like Filipowski, Mark Mitchell, like all these guys are five stars. Tyrese Proctor, like they got, you know, guys off the bench that are five stars. Um, <laughs> they're not a four seed as far as like roster talent. They're a four seed as in they, you know, just screw up here and there. So obviously in a one and done yeah. setting, that's not great. But in a one and done setting too, that's a team that can easily make a final four. So. Somebody that Houston's gonna have to deal with for me. Yeah, it, it's a it's a fair point, right? Like they they managed to uh, they managed to come up uh, flat in sort of the most kind of heroic and and epic ways throughout the season. That's very much so what has led to them being listed as a four seed. Before we move on to the West region, we see all y'all out there rocking with us. If you have not already, hop up into those comments. Let us know how you're feeling about both the East and the South regions. Jump in there like Jay or like Napsey Hustle did and plant your flag on your Final Four. We want to know who you feel is making their way out of each of these regions as we move on to the aforementioned West region. So, Mike, while I get this pulled up, why don't you uh, lead us through your your kind of initial thoughts on, on how you put together this side of the bracket. Yeah, and then Ryan, uh, also with the comment, asking about Auburn UConn, which we covered at the very top. But, yeah, we talked about, Ryan, uh, we didn't forget about your comment, man, that I, UConn has one of the hardest paths. I think it's interesting once they get past Stetson, no matter who they get in the second round. And then, yeah, Auburn is the one team that I feel like UConn did not want to get on their side of the bracket because they are so deep, because they do have shot blocking with two guys, uh, because they have so many ways uh, as far as, like, to, to play style up and down, like Grindhouse, if they wanted to. Um, number four on Ken Palm. I said top six. They're actually number four on Ken Palm yeah. um, efficiency. So, uh, yeah, that's a real thing. Uh, UConn, while we both have them in our in the in the championship game, that's a real thing. So, uh, yeah, oh, man. Literally uh, hovering over that change this morning. <laughs> right? Like, right? It's, like it's so going to be razor thin. Absolutely. So, we'll slide on over to the West. Uh, kind of tease it a minute. <laughs> But, you know, at the top, we, we still like North Carolina to get past Michigan State. Even though I would not be shocked to see Hubert Davis uh, post-game interview try, trying to explain to us what happened. Uh, the the tweets coming out from, from the big heads saying it's Izzo season. Like, no one's going to be shocked <laughs> because this team started off as a top-five team preseason. They still have the same talent. Played a hell of a schedule this year. They're not going to be shocked by the talent on the floor. They need to get past the grindhouse that is Mississippi State. Try to try to not get beat up by Tolu Smith and Cameron Matthews and DJ Jeffries. But I think a lot of people have that, which I, Mississippi State's got a chance there. You know, I know a lot of people are, are, are going Michigan State. I would love to see the Michigan State North Carolina matchup match for sure. So, you know, it's what's kind of interesting though, man. And we're on the same sentiment here. We don't have Alabama getting to them in the Sweet Sixteen. <laughs> Uh, I have the shocker, and this one took me forever to get to. The bracket revealed, I tweeted out, like, this is not good. Grand Canyon getting St. Mary's. Just an absolute yeah. grindhouse. But whoever wins that game, I feel like, is going to beat Alabama. Um, St. Mary's, like, just going to beat you up. Um, they have enough offense this year. Grand Canyon has the talent. People don't realize the talent on this team. Like Tyon Garrett Foster, man, like he is an NBA player, started his career at Kansas, some injuries and things like that. Now he's a superstar for them. Uh, you know, Harrison's an awesome guard. McLaughlin at Ford's pretty good. You have Blackshear coming off the bench for 15, 20 minutes. He's a former whack preseason and uh full like an entire season player of the year. Um, now he's not the same player because of the injuries the last couple of years, but talent-wise alone, I was really hoping Grant Canyon wouldn't draw St. Mary's. Um, but that's exactly who they got, so that's what we have to go with. But Ken Palm line, man, it's uh, it's pretty close. So, you know, those lopes, man, I feel like they can do business and get to North Carolina. We both have, uh, you know, you have St. Mary's obviously taking out Alabama, 
Maybe we're sleeping on Bama a little bit, man. Um, we've watched Mark Sears and Aaron Estrada do their thing. Grant Nelson, we know how talented he is, kind of an up-and-down type season. But we like what Grand Canyon can do as far as going up and down with them. And you obviously like what St. Mary's can do uh, with them as far as uh, on the defensive end and kind of slowing that Nate Oates offense down. So when we look at the bottom, we're nearly identical. We have New Mexico beating up Clemson. Um Man, I wanted to pick Clemson because it feels like everyone's on New Mexico. Um, yeah, can get there. another place you, you, know can, I mean? you can create a little leverage, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have uh, we got Arizona. You know, I, here we go again, right? Like, <laughs> disappointment is just absolutely waiting for us there. But the only place we differ is uh, is Dayton, man. I, back and forth with Nevada. I feel like we're not giving Deron Holmes enough credit and, and what this team's been able to do. Uh, so yeah, give us, give us some, uh, some Dayton Nevada matchup all day long. That's going to be an absolute fun one to watch. Uh, and then we both have North Carolina, uh, you know, I have North Carolina getting past Grand Canyon, um, and, and then Arizona to make the final four. You have St. Mary's pulling the upset over the Tar Heels and Arizona beating the Gales to make the final four. So we can kind of talk through us through that decision that you made. Yeah, so um, I mean, we we have to we have to walk down Narrative Street, which is North Carolina and Arizona facing off um, at the at the very last round of, of this bracket. Um, you know, we we've we've got these two teams. Uh, we've got each of these. Each of us has these teams advancing. You have North Carolina. I have Arizona. I think it's going to be a razor thin game, but you know, between that one, you know, for for me, I, I feel like North Carolina is a is is a is a little bit more prone to. Um, you know, kind of, kind of coming up flat in in big moments, whereas Arizona just does it randomly, right? So uh, I'll I'll take the I'll take the chaos of the of the Arizona side, uh, kind of walking <laughs> walking chaos. back, walking back to some of the earlier matchups in uh, in this region in particular. That that Dayton Nevada one is is super close for me as well, right? I think you know Holmes is is easily um you know the the most prolific player on on either of these squads i just i feel like i feel like nevada is a little bit more of a well-rounded squad and can can beat you a couple of different ways whereas with with dayton you know it it, it feels like you know he's uh, uh deron holmes is gonna have to kind of put them put them on his back to, to to carry him through and he's he's certainly capable of it right so that that was one that was close but ultimately i kind of went with the with the team ball and and went with the the nevada side um yeah, I mean, look, I, I mentioned it on the the bracket reveal show. I was I was pissed that Grand Canyon got this draw in the in the first round, like almost almost any other five seed, and I would feel I would feel great about selecting them to advance. Just St. Mary's is is so effective on the defensive side; they're so good on the glass. Like I just I don't know where these extra possessions are going to come from for for Grand Canyon to take advantage of their their three ball and their ability to score. So I you know I've I've got them narrowly following but yeah point point being right like you know both of us both of us God, that's gonna be a about, hell of a game man <laughs> i know i mean it's it's gonna be one of the games of of this entire region and in you know uh, from top to bottom and it just so happens to take place in i the, love this region round. top to bottom like look at it north carolina mississippi state michigan state st mary's grand canyon alabama even charleston clemson new mexico baylor colgate and their three-point shooting dayton and nevada should come down to a last possession game. Like even Long Beach, man, has beaten some P five teams this year. Yeah. Uh, man, what do you think? What do you think about this Clemson New Mexico deal, man? Like this is this is a everyone's picking New Mexico, man. Like everyone's doing it. Like everyone's picking James Madison. Everybody's picking Samford. A lot of people are picking Nevada over Dayton. Like it feels like these we just fall in love sometimes. Uh, that's why I'm having a hard time picking Tech. You know, uh, North Carolina State over Tech. Big 12 was very strong and tech, you know, finished way up there. Whereas North Carolina state had to do the Cinderella run to, to get in. But any thoughts stylistically matchup wise? I mean, this Clemson, New Mexico, it's got a lot of stars in that game. So any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's just the, the star power for, for this New Mexico squad. And, and this is, this is a team that's really like, it's, it's overhauled itself, right? Like you talk about house and Mashburn, you know, these, these are guys that can compete in the you know in the in the power six conferences and and would be um you know would be stars in in those ranks you know new new mexico for forever was just kind of like they were they were one of these like kind of bigger stronger type of teams that could just sort of like muscle their way through the the mountain west 
and and now like they they play a more athletic modern game that you know they can they can get the pace going and there's a lot of different ways that they can they can they can beat you up whereas Clemson has just been kind of like above average like good throughout the year but haven't really shown me like that ability to reach back and and really you know really tap into that that greatness and you know, I, I think that that's you know that kind of next level is what you need to to advance in 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 the in the big dance. So, you know, for for me, New Mexico is is going to advance out of this one. But to your point, like it's it's going to be a pretty popular pick because they also are coming off of that magical run through their conference tournament, right? So, might be an opportunity to get a little different from the field when and going on the Clemson side. Yeah, I mean, when you look at this, the the way it's played, though, like New Mexico has the advantage with the guards. Should be able to run circles around Ger- Gerard and Hunter. Um, but Clemson can body these guys up. I know there's Nelly Jr. Joseph. I know JT Toppins had a fine year. But Shifflin and Hall are some big boys, some big bodies, yeah. and they will beat you up. So it's a classic tale of, like, can New Mexico withstand the blows inside uh, that Shifflin and Hall are going to give them? And can Gerard and Hunter, can they hold up uh, with – I mean, you talked about House and Mashburn, but Donovan Dent has kind of been the story for New Mexico this year. He kept them afloat uh, until these guys, you know, dealing with injuries, House and Mashburn this year, and was putting up some crazy stat lines when they weren't in. So, uh, yeah, man, like this is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal side. And there's a comment in here saying, Narrative Street, I think I have it, North Carolina and Arizona. That might be the most watched, like, game, regardless of the like who's playing in the national championship. That has – that has a, a crazy, crazy storyline behind it. You know, everyone wanted to see Texas A and M and Texas play last year, and Penn State handled that. But <laughs> this one would be, oh, oh man, so good. Yeah, the, this uh, this side of the bracket has has got the the people going right. Uh, Ryan saying that he's had Arizona winning the last two years. He won't do it again. So he knows that they're going to cut down the net. And Jay trying to lure him over to the dark side. Come back. Pick Zono one more time. This is going to be a fun one. Third time is the charm. So definitely a lot of fun matchups to watch here in the West. Before we move on to the final region that will break down the Midwest, if you are checking with us on YouTube, scroll up a little bit in those comments. You'll find the link to our one and done bracket challenge. That is your opportunity to play with the broskies in basketball, to play with all the breadheads out there. And if you win, you'll take home an inked Caleb Love jersey since we're talking about Arizona. According to many, at least Jay and whoever else he can recruit, a soon-to-be national champion, Caleb Love. So that would be a pretty nice addition to any collection. All you have to do is hit the form. Make sure you're subscribed here on YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube, get over here. search, Search Green Screens Media, or you can go to the show page on Twitter at one and done CBB have all the information pinned up in there. So want to see this thing grown. We're going to be north of 50, might even push well beyond that with another 36 hours or so to fill that joint up. Want to see every one of you in there and mixing it up with us as we move on to the Midwest region. This is one that I I like Purdue's path a lot, mainly because of the side of the bracket they're on. So Mike, what's your thought on how this one lays out for the one seed and some of the other teams that you have advancing through from this side? Yeah, so I got a comment. Uh, Zach Eady will take your sushi. Appreciate you joining us, man, saying Purdue won't have a game within the, uh, within 25 points. That may be true in the first couple of rounds, but you got the uh, the best two seed and the best three seed. <laughs> uh, now the four and five seed, both of us have them going down. So – Sanford and Kansas. This this line is moving because Kevin McCullough is out. Mm. One, and I think Jeff Barzella tweeted this out, and I retweeted it uh, or quote tweeted it, saying this guy gets it. I don't even care if Kevin McCullough was playing in this game. Like the way that kind of Kansas season has gone, the fact that you get a team in Sanford that we have been just absolutely loving the uh, the entire season here. You know my recipe for for upsets, man. Like it's always it's always the same thing every single year. Uh, it is teams that get up and down, they shoot threes, and I'm getting a bonus. I'm getting a bonus. I usually don't get a big man that can that can uh, you know really wreck some havoc and, and has double double ability and uh, a chore chore. 
So you're giving me what I want and a little bonus on the side with that. They're seventh in the country in effective field goal percentage. They're eighth in the country in three point shooting. They're 20th in the country in two point shooting. Like they're top 50 in assist rate. I, I don't know. Like this is, uh, they, they do have tendency to obviously turn the ball over. They play at the top 20 pace. This is not going to be a fun game at all for, for Kansas. Like it's just, after everything that's been going on, last thing you want to do is see Sanford come in here, running around with four guards, shooting three balls, running up and down the court, a chore chore, moving, moving Hunter Dickinson around. We know, like, I, I get that he averages a couple of blocks a game. Shot blocking does not tell the entire story of a defense <laughs> because you can block one or two shots. Uh, doesn't mean that you can not get exposed and 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 pulled out from the basket and get put in high high pick and roll and open up a uh, you know a skip pass for an open three. And I just feel like with the true true man, like along with these shooters, like this is a very very underrated team. And I get it, right? Like Purdue beat these guys down first game of the year, just an absolute slaughter fest. Um, I actually had them uh, advancing to get to Purdue and then getting beat again because uh, I just feel like Purdue has enough shooting with Braden Smith and with Lance Jones, a uh, 3 and D guy, and then you yeah, obviously have the, the problem in the middle with Edie. Um, the, the shooting's not there for Kansas. That's been the issue. That's where they're different from Purdue, right? Mm-hmm. They don't have shooting. DeWan Harris is, can't shoot. He's not a shooter. KJ Adams can't shoot. Johnny Furphy is a freshman. He's flashed a lot. And then Nicholas Timberlake, you know, Towson could, could really score the ball. Hasn't hasn't done it. Now Kevin McCullers out. You're gonna have to be running like <laughs> you're gonna be running out guys that you barely play 10, 15 minutes this year that haven't even haven't really flashed that. Much. Marco Jackson's been okay. Um, yeah, this is a this is a weird spot for Kansas. It almost feels like they're just kind of ready uh, <laughs> for this thing. We see Bill Self just like talking today. It was like, oh man. <laughs> He knows he's in trouble, but McNeese, man, your boy Will Wade. Shahada Wells comes through from TCU. Mm-hmm. Absolute stud. They get Christian Shoemate back um, for another season. Dominant big man. Gonzaga. I mean, we're, maybe we're not giving Gonzaga enough love, man. Like that's a that's a good team that's been playing very well down the down the stretch here. EK is getting back to being a 20 and 10 guy. Ryan Nimhart's one of the best point guards in the country. No one's talking about. Um, they play a different style too, which is a little scary. So the one I went more back and forth on was actually this Gonzaga uh, in Mid-East side because stylistically Gonzaga plays different than any other team, any other team. So for me, when you're running out three guys that are 6'9", 6'10", 6'10", and other teams are running out like Sanford <laughs> – a bunch of little guards and then one big guy that's six nine. It's just a completely different look. I mean, you don't play teams like this anymore. It's not like the six ten guy at the three. It's Anton Watson. He's not a wing. So uh, I'm Zach Eady takes your sushi, man. He's got he's got some hot takes. I guess he thinks I'm smoking. Uh, yeah, I, who cares what they did in the first game? Like <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't make that doesn't mean anything and the next time someone plays like you can beat somebody by 50 and then lose by two the next time uh Ryan Shavel saying Dixon's supposed to play he is supposed to play um so we'll see if he's 100 percent with a dislocated shoulder apparently practiced the last couple of days uh what do we got here Rick Mounts jumper appreciate you jumping in and only wins because will Wade gives <laughs> gives few the bag that's hilarious <laughs> hey that's an awesome comment. Myron said, call me crazy. Did a sprinkle of McNeese making the final four 80 to one. Yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, they're a good, great team. It's Will Wade. All he does is win 70% of the time because, like Mike said, they're lack of scoring. If Dickinson's out, who's going to score? Dickinson's going to have to score 50, like 40. They just don't have any shooting. That's been the problem since the first game. They don't have any shooting. Like, there's no Grady Dick. So. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were hoping – to to get some of that or at least a, a poor man's version of it with Johnny Furphy, but you just you can't rely on that with with a with a freshman in the in the NCAA tournament, right? So like this was gonna be a tough spot for Kansas either way. And and now with you know being being down the color, I, I think that Sanford is going to be a very popular pick. Um McNeese, you know, we both have them advancing past Gonzaga. 
this was another one that I was I was pretty irked about how the how the matchup fell for them, right? Um, I'm I'm taking a bit more of a principled stance with uh with McNeese State, right? Like all of the things that I'm looking for in a team to pull an upset, McNeese State does in spades, right? They play at a slow pace, they create turnovers, they they clean up the offensive glass, right? Like, you know, the more possessions that they have against a team like Gonzaga the the more and more of an edge that Gonzaga has over them, right? So slowing down the pace, creating those extra possessions. But what what's really what's really interesting for me with McNeese is, you know, you you look back to their their best win of the season. They beat UAB back in November. They actually they kind of changed their stripes a little bit. McNeese is not a a prolific three point shooting team in terms of their frequency at which they th- they shoot the three ball. But in that game against a higher caliber team. They went out and shot 19 three-pointers and they made 10 of them, right? So like in these moments, it it seems like Will Wade, who is, you know, he learned at the knee of Shaka Smart at VCU, you know, he he knows that you have to increase, you know, these kind of higher risk, higher variance type of plays in these moments where you're an underdog. So I think that this team is poised to, you know, to rise to the moment against Gonzaga. And then, you know, because of how the the bracket falls, you know, I, I think they're certainly competitive in a 12-13 matchup against Samford. So that one in particular should be pretty close. Um I mean both of us have have Purdue advancing um in the in the third round and eventually making the uh the elite eight out of out of this uh out of this region. I have them actually advancing to the national title. You have them dropping to Creighton, which is one of the areas that were different in this bracket overall, right? Um I, like I mentioned before, really need uh, really need Tennessee to uh, to take care of Creighton because I think that that matchup is much better for uh, for my Purdue pick than a matchup against uh, seven plus footer Ryan Cockbrenner down <laughs> low. So um, definitely one of the areas that that were different overall. But I I think um, you know universally we we like the two and three seed to represent kind of the bottom side of the bracket. I, I love your your Oregon pick over over South Carolina. That was one that I I thought long and hard about. I eventually went with South Carolina just given the strength of the conference. But that's one that I I, I could totally see going going either way and, and don't mind your call there. Isn't that, maybe, isn't maybe that walk weird us though? through yeah, isn't yeah, it how, weird how though that, that like the eleven seeds are just teams that ran through their t- like, so you got NC State and eleven playing a Texas Tech team that played good all year. You had Oregon run through the Pac-12. South Carolina played great all year. Couldn't stop singing their praises. New Mexico was by the committee standards out of the tournament. Ran through and was a bit they were the fifth bid sealer. Like now they're you know obviously matched up with Clemson, who you know maybe not as like South Carolina, uh, you know not as consistent. But it seems like we're just gonna the 11 seed. All right, they're playing hot. Let's just let's move them forward. I mean. Yeah, so I, I I'm nervous that <laughs> you know recency bias over over a season long, um, but there's there's something to that, right? Like something you hear it all the time with coaches, like playing the hottest basketball at the right time is is definitely a thing. So yeah, I, I do like Oregon, uh, especially in the Folly Dante. I think he can kind of neutralize Colin Murray Boyles down low, who's been a, a fantastic freshman. Like Kali did. Obviously, the, he's the X factor and the reason why Lamont Paris uh, was. It's just so successful this year, along with Michi Johnson and BJ Mack coming over from Wofford. But yeah, these six eleven games, like th- these aren't really upsets to me. Like these are, you know, some of these teams are favored. Super it's, tight. Yeah, it's just super tight. The seven tens are just evenly matched too, because the Mountain West was seeded so poorly. Um, these Mountain West teams that are elevens are 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 real. I mean, Mountain West, we we've been singing it all all night long. So. Yeah, I think for me, man, like we get to Purdue, you go to you go with Tennessee, obviously Dalton Connect, right? And then they have a bunch of veterans. They play great defense. Me, it's Creighton. Uh, they have the big man that can not maybe stop Edie, but I mean he, he's a big dude, Cock Renner, um, Big East play, uh, defensive player of the year a few years in a row now. I mean Baylor Shireman, it's it's time, man. It's time. And Trey Alexander is so streaky. Stephen Asher is kind of that key to that team, though, man. If he's if he's shooting threes and, oh, man, like they just – they can beat you inside. They can beat you outside. You worry about them a little bit defensively if you, if you get a center that can is a little more mobile, which is why I like the matchup against Edie because Kalkbrenner is not going to be asked to, like, get out and high ball screens. 
um, and, and play some drop coverage. He's going to be asked to guard Zach Eady, and they have you know they have King that can come in and, and spell some. He's a big boy too. He's been around the program for a few years now as well. He can bang around. So, yeah, man, like I, I get it, but it's Purdue, right? It feels like at some point, like they're going to break through and and really come through. Um, but until we see it, they've lost to a fourteen, a fifteen, and a sixteen the last three years. So it's kind of tough to. The, you know, like this is a bad two three draw for them, I guess, of all the teams. Like, they could have drawn Iowa State, they could have drawn Arizona, and like, you much rather feel comfortable yeah. about that as well. So, that's that, that's kind of the thing, right? I, I think they they arguably have the the toughest two three draw out of any of the regions, but their their path to getting to that game feels much clearer to me than arguably any of the other one seeds, right? So, um, you know, they they can definitely build up some momentum. And, and look, I've I've been out there banging on Purdue for their recent tournament performances probably more than anybody. But, I mean, this this year's team is is different, right? You've got Braden Smith taking the leap. Um, we, we love what, what Jones gives to them. Um, you know, however you slice it, you against Creighton, me against Tennessee, I think they're going to have a real tough matchup in that Elite Eight. I've got them advancing on. You've got them falling to Creighton, which takes us to – our final four is Mike. Do you want to uh, you want to you want to jump in a little bit and talk through how we've got the final fours shaking out in each of our respective brackets? Yeah. So uh, for you, <laughs> uh, you get to UConn, Arizona. That that would be a fun matchup. Two teams that can shoot the lights out of it. High quality right. offenses. You know. So you got the one of the two. I go to the double one here. Uh, I got UNC getting there. This. I feel like UNC has the easiest path of all the number ones. And I just feel like Redemption Arc is there. Uh, but it's obviously a battle of two teams that have played for it all in the last two seasons. So what a storyline. That would be one's trying to go back to back. The other one's trying to complete that Redemption Arc. And then you also have Kentucky playing Purdue. So you got the three against the one there. And that would be a awesome battle of guard play. Like just, just filled with awesome guards that can shoot, that can pass, that can do some things defensively. And then you got the old school big man uh, Zach Eady in there trying to trying to do some things. So I think that would be interesting. Uh, but Kentucky has a bunch of former five star high school guys. Uh, Aaron Bradshaw. You've got uh, Oyenso. You've got a, a visage from overseas. They got a bunch of seven footers they can throw at them. I think that's definitely interesting as well. And then Duke Creighton uh, is is uh, is my uh, other final four matchup here. Just heavy usage guys. I mean, it's a it's a it's a, it's a Creighton heavy usage side against kind of a matchup night where and, ta- and talent stand. Even though they don't always show their talent in Duke, but to me, man, like you got to beat some of the best players in the world every time you play Duke. So, um, yeah, man, that that wraps up our final four. So, uh, why don't you break down the uh, the finals here that we have? Yeah, the uh, the the finals are are pretty interesting in terms of where you and I differ. And uh, where uh, where you and I are are the same, um, you know, I've I've got UConn uh, defeating Purdue and what you know most people have as the the two best teams in uh, you know over the course of the season. Um, you know, UConn will come in battered and bruised, having advanced their way through uh, through the East region. So I I think that is probably why you have. UConn making their way to the final, but eventually falling short against Creighton, uh, who will uh, in in your in your universe win uh, win their first national title, right? So this is a Creighton team that you know you have been something for all season long. I, I think it's you know one of the most not only the most talented teams, but just the the best constructed teams, right? We talked about it a little bit when when Nemhard left by way of the transfer portal, right? Like. You know, felt like it was a big loss for them, but the you know the way that they were able to build kind of supporting pieces around this this squad, definitely think you've you've got a defendable choice there in uh, in Purdue in uh, Creighton, I should say. Uh, while I have UConn eventually making their way to uh, to hoist a back to back title, so that's how we have this one shaking down. Uh, this has been this has been a, a ton of fun tonight going through our two brackets. Uh, you know, putting it all out there and kind of talking through our reasoning and our logic. If uh, if you are one of the many, many people who have been in the chat tonight and you want to see how 
your brackets would stack up against ours. You have a sneak preview of where our heads are, so should be able to uh, to create a little bit of leverage against us. But if you also want to see how you shake up against all of the other breadheads in the GSM universe, head up into the top of that live chat. You'll see a link to our bracket challenge where you can see how you stack up against everyone in our community, but also the winner is taking home a signed Caleb Love jersey. So your opportunity to get up into that bracket challenge to mix it up with all these breadheads. And if you build that best bracket, you can also get this bread. Thanks for stopping by the office. Get your fantasy prescription by subscribing to the channel and checking out drrodo.com. And until the next visit, be well and take care.